My name is John Mark Johnson Jr. and I am the host of this channel, Reform GGA. And today we're going to be talking about this little gun right here. This is a gun that is made by Palmetto State Armory here in the United States. And they call it the AKV and of course it is in 9mm. Before we get into that though, I need to warn you guys right up front that this channel is probably not going to be for some of you, just to be brutally honest. This channel tends to produce some fairly long videos. This one's probably not going to be an exception. This channel also um, tends to be rather opinionated. I have opinions that are usually not overly popular with certain groups of people, and I tend to be very critical of a lot of things with a lot of different guns. And I'm kind of that way with most guns. I can, you know, usually find something bad in just about every gun that's out there. That doesn't mean I don't like them, but I'm going to talk about all the things I don't like, and that's just kind of par for the course. Lastly, I do not take footage of myself when I'm out shooting, and because of that, my videos do not include shooting footage, at least as a general rule. And because of that, you know, this channel just really isn't going to be for certain people. Okay? You have been forewarned. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into the AKV in 9mm from Palmetto State Armory. Now those of you who have been following my channel for the past month or so know that I've already put out some videos on it and I wound up taking those videos down partially because, well, frankly I did some stupid things and didn't realize certain things and we'll talk about that. So part of it's on me. There are certain things that I brought up that turns out that they're not really valid. Uh, complaints. Like I said, I, I do tend to be fairly critical of a lot of guns, and I was probably overly critical of this gun. And so I take those videos down, and this video is going to be kind of my final wrap-up summary and going to replace uh, those earlier videos and hopefully deal with the subject more accurately. So what are my final thoughts on this gun? at least as they stand right now. I've put over 800 rounds through it of varying kinds of ammunition. And um, honestly, I, I'm not really sure <laughs> entirely what to think about this gun. So I'm just gonna kind of run through the features here that it has real quick and I'll just kind of tell you what my overall impressions on each feature is and Hopefully that'll give you an idea of where to go. Uh, from there, we'll go ahead and start at the end here. As the gain, uh, gun came shipped, it had this kind of compensator muzzle brake thing on the end that I personally do not like. I'm not a big fan of compensators or muzzle brakes on 9mm guns in general, just because for the general recreational shooter, they tend to be more problematic than not. I mean, we're only talking about a 9mm. They're not overly powerful guns in the first place. And if you're doing, you know, semi-auto firing, which the average civilian is going to, and if you're not rapid firing, you know, you're not, you know, engaged in doing a lot of bump fire, which is fun, by the way. And this gun is a good bump fire candidate for those of you who are interested in that. It is approved in that regard. It is a good bump fire gun. Uh, if you're not doing bump fire though, and you're not a competitive shooter that really needs those fast follow-up shots and concern about that, the muzzle brake compensator that they put on most 9mm guns, including this one, I find to be excessive, tend to cause the, the barrel to dip a little bit, can be rather annoying. So I usually take them off. And what is nice about this gun, and I'm giving kudos to Palmetto State Armory on this, is that they retained the basic AK way of attaching muzzle devices and that they have a, a little detent on the, uh, the the front of the gun here. And that little detent allows you to very quickly screw on and place a muzzle device or very easily take it off. You don't need to get a wrench out like you do with a lot of other guns that are out there. In fact, most other guns you're going to have to get out some kind of a wrench in order to get the muzzle device on or off and those kinds of things. And it's just a royal pain. So even though I don't like the compensator that they sent with it, I am very appreciative of the fact that they retained the basic AK uh, way of attaching muzzle devices and that they kept that little uh, plunger there that allows you to easily put muzzle devices on and off and gives you greater customizability. So that's a good thing. I like that. Good job, PSA. Uh, going back from there, this particular version of the AKV has these nice 
uh, redwood handles and and uh, and grip on, on the bottom side and I actually really like the look of it and these things kind of change in the light there's some ways that you hold the gun they almost kind of disappear and almost kind of look black with the rest of the gun and in certain light they really pop and they almost look like kind of like a, a cherry tree red uh, just depending on how you're holding the gun and what kind of light is shining on it and that's really cool and I like it and I frankly like the overall look of the gun and a lot of people that I've gone shooting with also like the look of the gun they think that it is a sharp looking gun and I have to agree that there is just something about the way the gun looks that is just stinking cool and for those people that want an AKS gun but maybe something that's a little bit easier to control maybe something that's a little bit cheaper to shoot depending on the ammo that you, ammo that you run in it uh, something like this can be very appealing like I said it kind of has the right look for some people 9mm is going to be the caliber that they want it in because they don't want something that is potentially as big or perhaps as expensive as typical AK rounds like uh, 762 by 39 or 545 by 39 they don't really want to go with those kinds of things and so something that's a little bit more on the recreational side um, a little bit easier to handle a little bit cheaper to shoot is going to be more their thing and having a gun that looks nice in the in that kind of purpose of use is kind of a, a, a good thing i i'm okay with that uh, coming back from there we'll go ahead and talk about the sights here uh, the rear sight is fixed which is not necessarily typical ak but it's the way this one works and it's basically a square notch and then the front post is a post that you screw down or up in order to adjust elevation and the post is offset just a little bit so as you twist it around you can adjust for windage a little bit there it's not an overly precise sighting system in my opinion but it gets the job done and this is also where I start having a little bit of a problem with PSA and that in the manual that they shipped out with this gun they said specifically that there was an adjustment tool that was ostensibly supposed to come with the gun that I did not find in the box I looked multiple times and it's just not there no adjustment tool now in some regards that's not that big of a deal in that when it comes to these nine millimeter guns these these PC3s as I call them pistol caliber guns with a third point of contact um, the open sights are kind of fast becoming obsolete and you know even as you see here I went ahead and put a red dot and a sight on it I, I just don't really use open sights all that much and so the fact that they didn't include the adjustment tool really isn't that big of a deal uh, just because I don't really use the open sights that much but it is still annoying that they said that it came with a gun and then it didn't so yeah but I will give them credit for this over a lot of other people that make PC3s and that is that the sights that they included are actually adjustable for both windage and elevation they are te technically functional I don't particularly like the sight picture that they provide but they are technically functional and this kind of system uh, in addition to just generally not liking it I also find it fairly slow as far as being able to get on target once you get on target and you get everything aligned it's actually decently accurate but getting everything aligned quickly is a little difficult with this kind of setup I like to have a, a, a rear peep uh, with a front post the notch is not optimal but at least they provide open sights and the open sights that they provide are adjustable not finely adjustable just because of the way that it works but good enough and definitely better than a lot of other companies that are out there for example Grand Power in their Strebog uh, I have a little bit of familiarity with that gun I used to own one the Strebog SP9A1 to be more specific and it was the dual recoil rod version uh, that they had going there I think they're on to another version now but at the time it was the dual recoil rod that I had and that one does technically come with open sights but they're not adjustable and frankly they're not great the, the sight picture is in my opinion even worse not absolutely unusable but definitely not great either so kudos to PSA for having adjustable open sights bad on them for saying that they included an adjustment tool which they don't so that is a bit of an issue 
And then coming down from there, of course, you have uh, the standard little uh, AK uh, disassembly lever here for what would normally be the gas tube, but this is a blowback gun, and so it doesn't really have a gas tube here. Instead, since it's blowback, this is basically just where part of the bolt mass sits, and so it's kind of a, a bolt guide. Right? Uh, but it still comes off in typical AK fashion. And one of the reasons why my original videos did not go over very well, and it's entirely my fault, is because I mentioned the simple fact that these, uh, this lever scratches the receiver. And we'll uh, get there, but it also is the case that the, the safety scratches the receiver. And you guys should be able to see that, that scratch that goes down the, the side of the receiver. I have never owned a AK platform gun before, and so I didn't know that that was actually considered normal and typical. All I thought was that the gun was scratching itself, and that seemed really odd to me. And so I made a big deal about it, and I got inundated with people telling me, no, that's actually pretty normal. I'm sitting there going, really? Seriously? You guys all tolerate this? And they're like, oh yeah. And like, people sent me pictures of their guns with a giant scratch down the receiver and all those kinds of things. Like, oh, okay, I guess that is a thing. I'm not sure why an entire group of consumers is okay with that. And granted, you know, guns are meant to be used and they're going to get scratched and dinged. Although I would kind of feel bad about scratching and dinging this one because frankly, it does have some nice wood furniture on there and it does kind of have a cool look. Um, I wouldn't want to get it dinged up too much, but, you know, if you use a gun, it's going to get dinged up. I understand that, but I want to be the one to do it. I don't want the gun to do it to itself. That's not fun. Um, you know, it's like the difference between, you know, telling somebody about all the scars that you have versus telling somebody about the freckles that you have. If you went out and you did something that got you a scar, that's a story that's worth telling, but you got a freckle? something that's naturally occurring. There's no story there. There's no pride there. Come on. Just personally, I don't get it, but evidently AK people are okay with a the scratch there. And as far as they're concerned, that's what makes it an authentic AK. Well, not the only thing, of course, but for them, they would be concerned if it didn't have it. You know, one that has the scratches on it is one that's actually been disassembled and used and all those kinds of things. And so good on that. Personally, still don't like that the gun scratches itself. Like I said, there's no bragging rights in that. You know, if I put the dent or the scratch or the ding in the gun, you know, there's a story there to tell. But hey, you see that scratch? I did it by flipping the safety lever. Just does not create as cool of a story at all. Just, just pointing that out. But evidently, it's okay in AK world, so that is the thing from there. All right, so... We've talked about the, the front end, we've talked about the nice wood furniture, we've talked about you know the open sights that are workable, uh, the fact that the lever and other levers, uh, uh, what would be the, the gas tube lever and the safety lever scratch the receiver, which is evidently normal, and all AK people are just like, eh, that's par for the course, it's, it's okay, it's good. Uh, I did not know that, because I've not been an AK guy before this, and you learn things. And you also embarrass yourself in learning things sometimes. And that's what I managed to do. Uh, but going back from there, now let's talk about the magwell. Now this is definitely not a normal feature for an AK. AKs are normally a rock and lock magazine system. They don't usually have a giant magwell on there. And this thing is a beefy metal uh, magwell. And the, the release for it is also very beefy and, and big and all those kinds of things. And so robust in that sense, but on a personal note of what I would expect, I don't particularly like this magwell, primarily for the, the reason that the edges are actually really, really, really sharp. And a lot of times I will do a, a, a kind of a, a modified magwell hold, similar to what I'm doing right here. I'm not actually holding on the magazine itself, but uh, will include part of the magazine. And with this gun, on bare hands, obviously if you're wearing gloves, it's not going to be that big of an issue. But on bare hands, that magwell is pretty sharp and just generally uncomfortable, and so I can't really do the hold that I really prefer with this gun. I'm, I'm gripping up on, on the furniture, which is what it's designed for. That's I get that. But it bugs me that I can't do what I do with so many of my other guns. And, you know, if you're expecting that to be a good place to hold on to, and you grab it and you, you know, scratch yourself and whatnot, not such a pleasant experience, you know, just saying, depending on what your expectations are. All right, going back from 
the magwell, which is big and beefy and kind of cool, but fairly sharp edges. Well, actually, while I'm there, another thing that does need to be mentioned is the fact that this is a gun that actually has a last round uh, bolt hold open, which is fairly unique for AKs. A, a standard AK and a standard AK caliber generally do not have last round bolt hold open. There's kind of some funky things that you can do with AK magazines, um, things that you can do to the follower and whatnot that kind of create a last round bolt hold open. Doesn't really work too well because as soon as you take the magazine out that has a special follower, then the bolt goes ahead and slams home. So it's kind of like a quick way to check and see that the gun is clear is what it winds up being not a true last round bolt hold open. Uh, but this one, they actually put in a true last round bolt hold open, and that's one of the things that attracted me to the gun. Personally, I do not like guns that have the charging handle on the right hand side. And for a lot of right handers, that's fairly common. You know, a lot of right handed people like to have the charging handle up on the front on the left hand side. That's no, more natural for a lot of people, uh, especially if that charging handle is non reciprocating, it is much more natural for people. If you have to have a reciprocating charging handle, in a lot of ways it makes sense to put it on the other side. But as far as manipulating the gun, you know, it becomes something that you either have to reach around and grab or reach under and grab. And it's just not as convenient as other systems. Uh, but with that additional little bolt hold open that they have on it, it really changes the nature of the gun as far as I'm concerned. By the way, this is an empty magazine. And I, I say things like that, that my magazines are empty or that the gun has been checked and cleared off camera, etc., etc., because there are people who are very concerned about safety and gun people representing guns in a safe way. And, and I get that. That's why I say things like that, to let people know that I, I do consider those aspects and I do want people to be safe and to think about those things on their own terms, you know, checking and clearing guns and making sure that they're safe and handling them and all that and setting a decent precedent that way. But yeah. Once the last round is fired, it, the magazine does in fact hold open that bolt real well. And one of the things that I love about this bolt hold open is one, it's fairly inobtrusive, which is good, but it's a sliding mechanism. Instead of something that you push in, you just pull it uh, in the direction that you would go for yanking out a magazine. And that's what will allow the, the bolt to come home. I like bolt uh, release mechanisms that are like that, that uh, slide instead of push in. It's one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of the AR platform. The AR, of course, doesn't have last round uh, bolt hold open as well, but to release it, it's basically a button on the, the side that you push, and me, I have the habit of laying the gun down just about any other way on the table, and with AR style guns, I'll you know set the gun down and Almost inevitably, I'll put it down on the, the side that has uh, the, the release button, and as I'm setting it down, that button will get tripped and send the bolt home. And it's not like it does anything, the gun is empty, but it's still really, really annoying and it's easily bumped, in my opinion, and so I don't like it. But this magazine release is fairly small, inobtrusive, and it slides instead of something being something that you push. And so for me, it's very, very, very functional, not easily uh, bumped, but still easy to manipulate. And so I really do like that part of the, the design. It is a good, solid design in that regard. Uh, no problems there whatsoever. And then as far as uh, the charging handle, it is fairly easy to charge, but I noticed that on this particular gun, it does hang up uh, right behind the magwell a little bit. And I've actually gotten it to to rest right there. The screen won't bring it forward sometimes if I'm going real slow, which is not a big thing when firing because that's not a big issue. But there is definitely a little bit of a catch right before uh, you get to the magwell. It just kind of sticks there a little bit. And again, that's one of those things that I'm, I'm picky about. Does it really affect firing that much in and of itself? Probably not. But it's one of the things that I notice and it seems inconsistent to me and I don't like. I like nice smooth action all the way back and the action on this gun while it's not overly heavy it is not overly smooth either and that does bug me um and then uh, while we're at that we'll just go ahead and talk about the uh, 
uh, the top rail here and cover. Let's go ahead and take this apart in typical AK fashion. It is a hinge top cover, hinge dust cover, uh, which I definitely do like. I like that it is retained and the fact that they've put it together fairly solidly at the back and have a decent lockup on the, the back end uh, lends to a greater amount of stability as far as mounting some kind of an optic on it. Now, I do get a little bit of impact uh, shift when I open and close the, the top cover, and that's going to happen because it's not going to open and close exactly the same each time, but it's pretty close, and as long as you're talking about relatively close ranges, it's not going to be enough to worry about for most recreational shooters. Uh, like I, In my experience with this particular gun, you know, take it for what it is, it's a sample of one, but in my experience uh, with this particular gun, as long as you're talking about a range of 25 yards or less, the impact shift that you get from opening and closing the dust uh, cover is not going to be worth, you know, really worth talking about. Now, if you're trying to push the range out to 50 yards or 75 yards or 100 yards, then the impact shift that you get from opening and closing the top cover can be a bit of an issue. And I'm not the only one who's noticed that. So just to, to back it up, you can go ahead and look at the Mystery Guns and Gear channel. Uh, Mike over there did a test with an AKV, very similar to this one, in which he tested the point of impact shift. And he tested it at 50 yards, and he found that the point of impact shift, I think, was less than an inch, so fairly negligible you know, for most people and most common applications, but it was there. And if you're hoping for an exact uh, you know, return to zero every single time, in the exact same way, eh, this is not the gun for you. But if you're looking for, you know, kind of an approximate zero that will kind of stay approximately where it needs to be, well, then this is sufficient. And for recreational use or even competitive use, as long as your your precision requirements are not super high, um, either that or just re-zero the gun each time you close the top cover, which to me seems a little annoying, but. Um, I can see competitors being okay with it, depending on what their accuracy requirements are. Um, so that is decent, and for common recreational shooting, it gives you a close enough zero to where it returns you fairly close to whatever your zero was. Um, not exact, but close enough that it's, for most people, not going to be worth worrying about. Uh, then, one of the interesting features about Palmetto State Armory's AKV versus some of the other AK 9mm guns that are out there is that they have this system of a spacer and a buffer on the back end. And a lot of times on a true AK, like I said, I'm not really an AK guy, so you can only take what I say with a, a certain grade of salt there because I'm not really familiar with AK platforms, evidently. And certainly not with full gas systems, but most of the people that I've heard talk about it are usually generally very concerned with true AKs shooting true AK calibers like 7.62 by 39 and 5.45 by 39. They get really concerned with their spacers and buffers in the gun. Now this is a blowback gun, so it's not gas operated, not quite the same things going on. And if you listen to a PSA talk about this, uh, they talk about it as being something that is an advantage, especially for competitive shooters, because it shortens the the stroke uh, that the uh, the bolt is going to go through, uh, shortens the overall impulse, allows you to get to faster follow-up shots, etc., etc., those kinds of things. And compared to other PC3s out there, other pistol caliber guns with a three point of contact, I wouldn't say that this one's necessarily faster than them. Uh, it might be faster than not having the buffer and spacer in, but I wouldn't say that it necessarily gives a huge advantage over those other gun types. Um, that's my experience, take it for what it's worth, but I personally don't see that as being a huge advantage. Now, this change was put in after Tim from the Military Arms Channel got an AKV 9mm for himself and had some significant issues with it after which Palmetto State Armory decided to basically relaunch the gun with some changes. They made some changes to the, the bolt, and they also included this spacer and buffer uh, that we see in here. And um, how much it does or doesn't do, I couldn't really say. Uh, but 
it's part of the the relaunch version of the AKV now, and so for better or for worse, that's what it is. Palmetto State Armory does not seem to be overly concerned about it, and they seem to think that it's a good thing. And a lot of uh, the normal users that I have talked to and who have talked to me uh, seem to be okay with it, so I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, but that is that is the thing, and of course this comes out basically like a standard AK. I know I'm not doing this off on screen properly, but push it in, yank it out, really long recoil uh, spring there, and then the bolt. You bring it back, and you can lift it out of the gun. And it kind of looks like a, a gas piston on the front, but that is just a superficial resemblance. All that that is is just a, a bat, a, uh, a mass of weight to basically make the gun operate uh, correctly. And of course, replacing it is also fairly straightforward. Put it in, and the hammer on this sticks up just a little bit, so you actually have to push in on the hammer while you're pushing the bolt forward. There's that. And then the part that I always have a problem with is that buffer and spacer system because you need them to be fairly close to, together to, to reinsert into the gun properly and they don't always like to behave. They kind of do weird things on the recoil spring. And trying to get it properly in that little detent in the back is sometimes a little bit of a problem. It's not terrible as far as field stripping. That's basically the field strip. You'd also take off what would be the gas tube, but it's blowback, so it isn't really a gas tube. Uh, the takedown isn't too bad. You know, take out the recoil spring, take out the bolt, take off uh, basically what is now the guide tube, and that's pretty much it. There's a little bit of playing with it that you saw, um, but it's not a bad takedown. And putting it back together is fairly straightforward as well. Um, kind of an interesting system, and most of the uh, AK platform guns in 9mm have a pretty similar takedown that I've seen. Uh, like the Kalashnikov version, I think that's, they call it like the KR9 or something like that. Excuse me. Has a pretty similar takedown, so this isn't really anything new. However, their version does not have spacers or buffers in it, and some people like that, some people don't. It, like I said, I don't think it really changes the performance enough to worry about one way or the other, so not a big issue there. Uh, the safety lever, aside from producing the scratch, which evidently is not a big issue in AK world, and I guess if you expect it going in and you know that going in, that's fine. Otherwise, it's just kind of bizarre, and like I said, you know, scratches are much more fun if you put them on the gun yourself. You know, it's the difference between telling people about your scars versus telling them about your freckles. You know, if it naturally occurs, not much of a story to tell there. Not very fun. Uh, but the safety lever itself is actually fairly nice. I really like it compared to a lot of standard AK levers. Especially this special little raised portion here that allows you to operate it with your index finger, with your trigger finger. I really like that part of it. Uh, I think that that is a fantastic improvement over a standard AK uh, safety lever. And I, if I do wind up getting a proper AK and a proper AK uh, caliber, I'm going to look for one that has one of these enhanced safeties that you can operate with your index finger. I think that is a good thing. And then the trigger on the gun, I've put it on my scale a few times have a little Lyman trigger scale, a little electronic one. And it usually comes in just a little under four pounds as far as trigger pull is concerned. It's not super consistent. Some of the times I've pulled it, and part of it might just be me. Some of the times that I've pulled it, though, it's come in under three pounds, sometimes a little bit more than four pounds, but on average, usually uh, just a touch under four pounds. And I think that's fairly accurate, but and I've been told that this is common with AKs, but I would not say that this is a very consistent trigger, not just by measurement, but also when I'm out there shooting it, some of the trigger poles seem to be a little heavier and to break at uh, one given point in the, the travel of the trigger, and other times it seems like it breaks in a little bit different point. It's not a super consistent trigger, and that bugs me a little bit, but the fact that it is fairly light out of the box, like I said, usually less than four pounds, usually makes up for it as far as I'm concerned. 
And in terms of PC3s, pistol caliber guns with a third point of contact, the trigger on this thing is actually pretty decent. I'm familiar with things like, say, the Caltech Sub 2000, which has an awful trigger pull. Uh, the CZ Scorpion, which is by far my favorite PC3, standard as far as its stock configuration is concerned, has a pretty awful trigger pull as well. Um, a, the Ruger PC Carbine. I don't think the trigger pull on that one is bad, but it isn't great either. And at least in terms of overall weight, this one is still better. Uh, the Strebog, the trigger on that one was a little bit heavier, but it was more consistent and a little bit crisper. So that trigger I, I did like um, better. Uh, but still, this one is at least comparable with all the other PC3s out there, if not better than them in terms of trigger pull. A little bit long, not overly consistent, but still fairly smooth and fairly light. And that, I think, has plenty of advantages. And that is worth talking about. And a lot of people that I've given this to and let them shoot it, one of the things that they like about this compared to a lot of my other guns is the fact that this trigger is much lighter than most of my other guns. They really, really, really like that because it feels more like other guns that they're used to. And that is worth talking about. Uh, the handle that it comes with this particular gun, this uh, Redwood furniture ver version, for me is definitely on the small side. Um, like I said, the CZ Scorpion is my favorite PC3, and the CZ Scorpion stock handle is very big and round and uh, quite quite easy to really get a, a full grip on and do one-handed manipulations very easily with. This one, not so much. Now, for rec common recreational shooters, you know, they're probably not going to be doing a whole lot of one-handed manipulations and all those kinds of things, so probably not that big of a deal, but I personally do find this handle to be a little too small for me and in the future I may look at replacing it and as far as I can tell it looks like it uses a fairly standard attachment system and so getting a new handle on there I don't think would be a major problem but the one that comes with it is too small for me at least in my opinion other people might say no it works out perfect and those kinds of things but for me it's small and then let's see going back from there we get this interesting triangle device here and I'm saying device because this is not actually a stock it looks kind of sort of like a stock although it doesn't behave like one this is of course a brace and a lot of people who are you know aware of these kinds of guns and interested in these kinds of guns know that the ATF has some really interesting rules when it comes to these kinds of guns particularly anything with a fairly short barrel is not allowed to have a true stock on it and so a lot of manufacturers have come up with what are basically workarounds. The, AK, uh, the ATF has said that it's okay to take a item as long as it's not stock and occasionally shoulder it, so it is perfectly legal to take it and shoulder it, at least on occasion, but it cannot actually be designed to be a stock, and this one certainly isn't. This is actually made out of rubber. The top part of it is actually fairly solid, but the bottom part bends quite a bit. It's very, 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 very flexible. And these bottom struts will actually bend as well. And so if you're thinking in terms of a normal stock, it's not going to feel quite the same as you're pulling in and it's kind of wobbly and wiggly. And that's just kind of par for the course. Um, I have other guns that are similar to that and it's kind of the same thing. It's not a true stock. It's not going to behave like a true stock. And unfortunately, you can't really expect it to. That's just... That's just the reality of it. Uh, but for what it is, it's actually pretty uh, decent. And if you're going to talk about length of pull with something that is not a stock, this is technically considered to be a brace. But if you're going to talk about length of pull with something that isn't really, like I said, not truly a stock and doesn't really behave like a stock, uh, the length of pull on this thing is about 13 and a half inches, which is fairly standard in America. So it's interesting that they were able to achieve that even with something that's fairly unconventional. And the lockup on it is uh, basically uh, kind of a, a rest and lock kind of uh, system. So this is, of course, a, a folding device, which gives you a little bit better uh, storage uh, capabilities. And all that you do to, to change the position is just to lift up on it, and you can take it and extend it or look, lift up on it again. And sometimes this one sticks a little bit. 
lift up on it again and that allows you to collapse it. I'm not a huge fan of these kind that you lift up on to, to rotate just because if you apply enough downward pressure on them you can get them to, to come out while you're shooting and then you're shooting this thing that's kind of folding on you as you're you're working with it and it doesn't work out that great. And I've had this gun do that a couple of times on me when I'm really getting aggressive with the gun. I'll sometimes wind up putting enough pressure on it that that, that joint comes out and it'll fold on me. But that's just common to the type. That's not necessarily a PSA problem. I've also had that with the SB1913 uh, brace, which works off of the, the same basic system. It's just kind of a, a problem with the design in general, that if you have one of those ones that is basically a, a tension system of one kind or another, they can be just a little finicky in that regard. Now, usually you can work around it uh, with a little bit of training and getting used to the best place to hold it and position it and those kinds of things. You can work around it okay. But if I had my druthers, I'd rather do something like they do on the CZ Scorpion here, where there's actually a, a true release button uh, that you have to have. And when it's in, it has a really nice lockup and it's not going to come out unless you actually hit that button. And so these tend to be very uh, stable and they don't w wander on you at all. And there's no chance of it and you don't really have to be super careful about technique with these ones. These ones though that have the little Picatinny rail section on the back, that's what this is attaching to, it's just a little section of Picatinny rail and then have that tension system in there that you lift up on. These ones do sometimes come out when you don't want them to. And like I said, it's mostly how you're holding the gun, where you're putting pressure, and with training you can get around that. But it is nice to have a system that you don't have to train around, that it's just not an issue. Just pointing that out. All right, so those are, oops, one last thing I wanted to mention about this brace that is not technically a stock. Uh, as you can see, it has kind of a, a half moon cut on the back end. And if you're shouldering it, you know, that's not bad. If you're doing the typical arm brace thing, which where you actually separate this and you use the arm bad to wrap around your arm, it's not bad that way either. But me, I tend to do a lot of sternum rest, or at least more chest rest than actual shoulder rest. And the fact that it has this half moon cut actually gets to be kind of annoying because this bottom part of it really digs into your chest if you pull it into your chest like I do. Is that a big concern for a lot of people? No, seriously, it's not. I get that. But I like to do it that way just because that is actually fairly safe ground as far as the ATF is concerned. The ATF doesn't really balk at people starting uh, resting these things. It's very safe, legally speaking. And the shoulder kind of takes them off a little bit, but they said it's okay to occasionally do. But they have absolutely no qualms and no, you know, further stipulations when it comes to something that's sternum rested. And if you're going to do sternum rest, that little half moon cutout kind of actually winds up digging into you a little bit. It's better if it actually just cuts down and it doesn't come back so that it actually can fit the contour of your chest. And if you're a rather portly fellow like myself, um, sometimes that curves out just a little bit more than normal and having that part come back really can dig into you a little bit. Is it a big issue for a lot of people? Probably not, but it is a concern that is out there and I wish that people were a little bit more sensitive to it. Uh, just to give you a, well, yeah, give you a comparison of what I prefer, and this gun is hot because it is doing self-defense duty right now, but to give you an example of what I prefer, I prefer something more like this stock that is on my full-size uh, CZ Scorpion carbine here uh, because it has a part that comes back, but the rest of it actually doesn't uh, bend backwards. When I'm holding uh, the gun level, it actually just comes uh, in and then basically uh, straight down. It doesn't curve backward with that little half moon cut. And that is much more comfortable to stern around stay. <sighs> I really need to move those boxes. Anyways, moving on from there. Um, so those are the basic features of the gun. Let's talk about how it actually did shoot. I have now put over 800 rounds through it, and frankly the performance has not been stellar. I've had a number of malfunctions with it. Uh, 
and I've tried a variety of ammo uh, just to show you some of the kinds of ammo that I've done, not all of them, but some of the kinds of ammo that I've put through it. I've put Browning 124 grain 9mm through it, of course it's a 9mm gun, duh, right? And then also some Winchester White Box 115 grain has gone through it. Some Winchester uh, NATO spec ammunition has gone through it. The 124 grain Spear Lawman has gone through it. And last, and certainly not least, and I'll get to get circle back around to this one, uh, the Wolf Military Classic 9mm steel case ammunition has gone through it as well. And out of the 800 rounds plus that I shot through it, um, I've had at least 11 malfunctions, probably a few more than that. I didn't retain every single malfunction that I had, but at least 11 that I have here that I can document. There was a couple of times with Remington, I don't have any Remington anymore because I shot it through the gun, uh, but a couple of times with Remington 115 grain white box ammunition where I get some light primer strikes. Um, which concerns me because I don't usually have that problem in my other guns. Now I've heard from people that Remington does have a problem with light uh, primer strikes, that the primers are actually fairly hard. I haven't experienced that with any other gun, but with this gun, the AKV, I have had that problem. Uh, another interesting malfunction that I had was when the bolt caught the, the back of the brass in kind of a weird way and actually sheared some of the, the brass right off of the, the cartridge. That was a, a feeding issue and uh, just kind of a weird thing. I've never actually seen that happen in a gun before. Most of my other guns are a little bit better behaved than that and don't shear off weird places on the brass. And then I have a bunch of feeding malfunctions. There's quite a few there and they're all pretty much uh, like this where the bolt gets bent and the brass actually gets caught up in the action of the gun and as the gun is trying to, to close the action it'll bend the bullet over. And these malfunctions by the way are kind of a pain to, to clear uh, because it usually involves dropping the magazine and those kinds of things and it takes a little while to get back in action after you have a malfunction like this. And I have quite a few of them here. Let's see, there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight of those kinds of malfunctions. One malfunction where it caught the back of the brass in a strange way. Two light primer strikes with Remington ammunition. And by the way, the ones where it caught the, the brass uh, on the lip or on the bottom, those are Winchester uh, rounds, I believe, the Winchester white box. Yeah, Winchester white box are the other ones. And frankly, that was really, really annoying. This gun cost me over $900. Now, of course, I also put on the red dot and that adds a little bit of expense as well. This is not an overly great red dot. This is just a, a Sig Sauer Romeo 5. Not an overly expensive or overly cool red dot, but not terrible. Um, so that adds a little bit to the cost, but not too much. But cost me over $900 and it didn't run very reliably as far as I'm concerned. You know, 11 plus malfunctions and 800 plus rounds is, you know, a greater than 1% malfunction rate. Now, if this was rimfire, um, a malfunction rate around 1%, I don't think would be terribly bad, especially if you're doing, you know, bulk rimfire ammunition, that would be pretty decent. But this is a center fire gun, not rimfire. And the ammunition that I was using was ammunition that, while it might not be considered high quality ammunition, is ammunition that runs fine in my other guns, generally speaking. Um, I usually do not have malfunctions, either in my 9mm handguns or in my 9mm PC3s, with those kinds of ammunition. Remington may have somewhat hard primers, but I've never had a problem with it in my other guns. Winchester White Box is not the highest quality stuff in the world but it usually does not produce feeding issues in any of my other guns. In fact, I don't think I've had a single feeding issue with Winchester White Box on my other guns. Just this thing. And this brings me back to that point that I said I was going to return to. The last but not least kind of ammunition being this Wolf Military Classic 9mm ammunition. This is steel case stuff. This is not considered to be high quality at all. In fact, it is usually very cheap. You can 
uh, a lot of times get this for less than 15 cents around, sometimes 14 cents around, sometimes 13. Sometimes you can find it uh, a good sale for like 12 and a half cents around. This is not considered to be overly high quality stuff, but ironically, this stuff ran flawlessly through the gun. No hiccups, no malfunctions of any kind with this, and I put hundreds of uh, these through the gun, at least 200 rounds of this stuff, without a single hiccup. Now, the other kinds of uh, rounds that I showed you, like the, the Spear Lawman and the Winchester NATO and the Browning 124 grain, those I didn't put a ton through the gun just because I don't have a ton of those kinds of ammunition. It was usually like a box of 50 or something like that. Um, so I didn't put a ton of those through, but I did put quite a few of these through the gun and it did just fine. Doesn't like the Winchester white box. It hangs up in the, the action weird ways. It doesn't seem to like the Remington too much. It'll give me light primer strikes from time to time. But the Steel Case Wolf runs through the gun just fine, flawlessly, which is weird and bizarre to me, but it does okay with this stuff. That's weird, but it works. And then as far as magazines are concerned, I actually really like the PSA AKV magazines. The standard magazine, which is this front part of the magazine, is a 35 round magazine. And I wouldn't say it's overly high quality. It's not like a Glock magazine that has, you know, a steel a liner on the inside and then polymer all over it. No, it's, it's a polymer magazine. It does have steel reinforced feed lips though, which is a big plus. And then they also sell these little 15 round extensions and that turns this into a 50 round magazine. You can put an entire box of ammunition in there, at least one of those small boxes, and you can just have all kinds of fun with it. It's totally awesome. And I found out that these magazines actually run really well in my CZ Scorpions. I have a couple of CZ Scorpions and they run real well with this. They're um, kind of a tight lockup. You know, it's kind of hard to strip the magazine out, uh, but for recreational use, 50 rounds that runs very reliably in a CZ Scorpion is a lot of fun, just saying. And these are not overly expensive. The, the main part of the magazine will cost you about 15 bucks plus shipping and handling. So buy in bulk and save some money that way. And then the extension is about 20 bucks. And the reason why the extension is more than the regular magazine is because the extension is not just the extension. It also includes a new floor plate and also includes a new uh, magazine spring so that it'll work in the overall length and things like that. And also it's not as popular of an item, so it's not produced in the same numbers, things like that. Uh, but it is great. Now, one thing that I did notice that you should not be concerned about, uh, but it is something to note, is that around the, uh, the base of the extension here, you can see that kind of slight discoloration on screen. And that's basically where the, the lockup between the base magazine and the extension is. That is perfectly normal and it does not affect the function of the magazines at all. Uh, but getting back to the issues of reliability, the both with the extended version and regularly without the extension on it, I found that these were not 100% reliable in the AKV. And of course, these are the magazines that the gun originally came with. Obviously, this one's been modified by putting the extension on it. Uh, but I didn't have 100% reliability. All of the mal uh, functions that I had with the gun were, were were with these PSA magazines. It's a PSA gun. Why isn't the PSA magazine running well on the gun? That I find weird. Uh, what I did not have any problems with in the gun though were these little 20 round CZ magazines. Now, of course, PSA said that they were using CZ pattern magazines, that that was what they were trying to go for. And these things worked out perfectly regardless of what ammunition I put in them. I never had a malfunction in the AKV if I was running these little 20 round CZ magazines with the little window on them. These are the, the new ones. It worked out just fine. I could put the Winchester white box that had problems in the PSA mag and this thing would be just fine. Like I said, even with the extension off, because I did shoot it that way as well, I would get malfunctions with the PSA magazine. Little 20 round CZ magazine did just fine in. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure what that is about, but you know, if I want to have more or less perfect reliability, just get some of these little 20 round CZ magazines. And it's not as fun as the big happy stick, but it is a way to eliminate malfunctions. Um, I did do a little bit of shooting with this gun with the Madpole uh, CZ Scorpion magazine, which does fit in the gun. 
Um, however, it doesn't really lock up very well. You know, if you really jam it in there, it's okay, but I've had problems with these Magpul magazines in my Scorpions. I've had a few malfunctions with these in the, the Scorpions, and those are the only time my CZs have malfunctioned is with the Magpul magazines, and I don't consider them to be bad, but if they have malfunctions even in the Scorpion, well, then yeah, I'm not going to really trust them in the other. But I kind of took them out of the, the testing at a fairly early phase, so I'm not entirely sure exactly what the performance was on, on those ones, but I know that I did have malfunctions, at least with the Winchester white box and the Remington green and white box, with the PSA magazines, both in the extended form and in the shortened form. Did not have any malfunctions whatsoever in the short CZ uh, windowed magazines, the little 20 rounders. So where does that leave me? The gun is kind of ammo sensitive, like I said. Doesn't seem to like Winchester white box or Remington green and white box. Everything else it ran okay, and the cheapo wolf ammunition is what seemed to run the best in the gun out of over 800 rounds of varying kinds. Where does that leave me? Well, it's ammo sensitive, and for a gun that cost me over $900, I don't find that to be suitable, quite frankly. You know, if I can run out and get a little Caltex Sub 2000, which I have messed with before, um, actually wound up getting someone for someone else you know out here in the free states it's very common to get guns for people as gifts and you know that's something that's gone on in america for a long time and i have no plans on changing that just because commies don't like it when people give guns to each other uh, but i've gotten guns for other people and yes they're people who are legal and safe and all those kinds of things um, but i have gotten guns for other people and among those would be a caltech sub 2000 for someone and the gun has been very reliable. It's a little ammo sensitive in that it doesn't like uh, flat nose projectiles, but that's not exactly an uncommon thing for you know a PC3 to be a little bit sensitive with regarding uh, flat nose ammunition and certain hollow points and things like that. That's not entirely odd. But full metal jacket ammunition, it runs just fine, and it's not a very expensive gun. You know, it's usually under $500, and there have been times, at least in the past. Right now, during the current pandemic, prices are doing a little weird things, but in the past, you could sometimes find it for under $400. And actually, that wasn't entirely uncommon to get it under $400. And it's much less ammo sensitive than this $900 gun. Now, to be fair, the Caltech Sub 2000 is not a very good looking gun. It's also not very fun to take apart or have to clean or reassemble. It's kind of a pain that way. And I wouldn't say that it's the most ergonomic or fun to shoot or those kinds of things, but it is actually very reliable for the price. This one is like twice the price, much more ammo sensitive, but I will admit it does look cool and it does have a certain fun factor. Um, are you getting your money's worth out of it? In my experience, no. Now, if I were to go to Palmetto and say, hey, your gun doesn't run very well with these kinds of ammunitions. I want it to run well. Can you guys help me out and fix this thing? I have a feeling that they would probably say yes. Palmetto is fairly well known for taking care of their customers in that regard. I have a personal problem with that though in that I like companies that do it right the first time. And I, I get that, you know, there's always going to be lemons that are out there. Even the best companies will, you know, have a quality control um, faux pas as it were and something bad is going to leave the factory and occasionally you're going to get a bad gun out there uh, i understand that that happens but my issue is that i'm not the only one who's had a problem with this particular kind of gun the psa akv has not exactly had a problem free history as I mentioned before, there was Tim from the Military Arms Channel who had problems with it, and PSA actually relaunched the gun. And this is one of those relaunched versions of the AKV, in which they supposedly fixed the problems. Well, there are maybe new problems, I don't know, but there are still problems with this gun in my experience. So it doesn't seem like the relaunch really fixed the problems that it should have. And when I was a part of the PSA AKV uh, 
a users uh, forum that was sponsored by PSA. I got kicked out for obvious reasons. I'm not definitely not a fanboy. And it seems to be a pretty fanboy-oriented page. I'm not saying that it's bad to, to get in there. There's actually some very helpful people there, and they can, they can do some good things for you. But when I was in there, I noticed that there were a lot of people who had various issues uh, with the gut. Some of them were kind of the external things that I mentioned of having sharp edges on the, on the, uh, the magazine. Well, there was people that complained about that. But there were also people that had uh, basically the, the same kind of malfunction that I was talking about with the weird case and deformations with the, the brass getting caught up in the action and causing the, the round to deform in weird ways. Uh, there are other people who had those kinds of issues, people whose extractors would break uh, within 200 rounds, which is not a good thing at all. Uh, just issues like that. There are at least a half a dozen of those kinds of posts that I noticed that were dated within the past week. Um, now granted, they make thousands of these things, and so half a dozen isn't super high, but half a dozen in a week is kind of high. And so I'm not overly impressed with Paul Metal State Armory right now. Like I said, if I were to call them up and say, hey, the gun's malfunctioning, I want you guys to fix it, they probably would fix it, okay, giving them the benefit of the doubt on it. But there's lots of people that have had issues with it, and you can get guns that are considerably cheaper that in my experience are considerably more reliable. And if you do want to spend the money, you know, a few hundred more dollars, you can get, you know, a gun like this CZ that is by comparison quite reliable. Now this doesn't mean that there's nobody out there who's ever had an issue with the CZ. In fact, this particular CZ has malfunctioned three times on me. And that was all with the Magpul magazines, and that's where I, I put the blame. But still, it is a fact that this gun has malfunctioned three times, and frankly, not 800 rounds. I haven't even put 800 rounds through this. I think I've only had like 300, maybe 400 through this thing. Uh, so not nearly as much. Now, like I said, that depends on the magazine, things like that. There's also some user error that was involved in one of those malfunctions. Uh, those kinds of things. So they're not perfect guns, but I do have a couple of these CZ Scorpions. The, the first one has been completely flawless. Like I said, this one with the Magpul magazines has had some issues. They're not flawless guns, and these guns have done some weird things to certain people. Uh, out of battery detonations can be bad in any gun, but in a gun like this that has a polymer frame, an out of battery detonation can be really devastating to the gun, and not something that's exactly, you know, just put some duct tape on there and it's good. It's good, but it doesn't really work on those. If you have an out-of-battery detonation with a CZ Scorpion, there's a really good chance that you're going to blow out the, the receiver, and that's going to be the end of the gun, basically. Um, so those kinds of things do happen, fairly rare, but they do happen. I understand quality control issues occur, but the fact of the matter is that that CZ Scorpion, even though it has had some malfunctions, it's not ammo sensitive. That isn't the issue at play. I know what the issue is. It's a magazine and user issue, it is not an ammunition issue. With the AKV, it is very clearly an ammunition issue, and that just bugs me. I'm going to keep the gun because having a gun that runs really cheap ammo flawlessly is not a bad thing. So I'm going to, to keep the gun as is, uh, just because having a gun that's cheap and easy to shoot and looks cool and and those kinds of things is, is doable. But if you were to ask me, would I recommend the AKV for people? I would, I wouldn't necessarily say no outright, but I would caution you severely in that obviously PSA does not have perfect quality control and no company does. But like I said, I've noticed in my personal experience and people that I've dealt with online and in real life, I've noticed that PSA, you know, does leave things out of their boxes. Other people that I've talked to that have gotten AR kits from them have had things missing from their boxes. And to their credit, PSA did fix the issue and sent out parts and those kinds of things. But all these people online and, in, you know, in real life, in person that I've talked to, all say the same thing, and that is that PSA has a consistent habit where they don't get things right the first time. They will eventually make it right for you, from what everything that I've heard, 
but they don't get it right the first time very consistently, and that really bothers me about them. And then, as far as the functionality of the gun, like I said, it's ammo sensitive. That's not overly encouraging, especially if you want something that can double in, you know, kind of a self-defense situation, or even in a competitive situation. You don't want to have one of those nasty jams where the the uh, cartridge actually gets caught in the main action, and you wind up having to basically take apart the gun in order to, to clear the jam. That's not a good thing. Uh, you know, recreationally, and as far as the cool factor and those kinds of things are concerned, I don't think it's a bad gun. Uh, but, like I said, PSA seems to have this habit where they don't get it right the first time, and it's pretty consistently so. That can happen to any company, but I've noticed it a lot with PSA with certain products, including the AKV, which was relaunched and supposedly fixed, and obviously not completely so. Um, you know, it's just... I just don't think that this particular product is really there. Recreational use, and if you just like the look and all those kinds of things, cool, good for you. But if you're trying to sell me on this being a real solid self-defense gun, my experience with it is that it's kind of finicky and ammo sensitive and you know can malfunction with brass ammunition. And that really bothers me because most defensive ammunition is brass ammunition. That's not a good thing. Um, you know, I would have some serious reservations about that. You know, as a fun collector's piece, you know, to say that you have an American-made AK platform gun, it's not a true AK, but AK-esque, you know, in 9mm, those kinds of things to, to be a part of the club and whatnot, okay. And is it fun to look at and cool and, and those kinds of things? Yeah. But like I said, self-defense, I really don't see it. Not that most people would like to use a 9mm um, gun for self-defense anyways, but, you know, it does happen. But this thing, I wouldn't say, is reliable enough for that, unless you plan on running steel case ammunition for your self-defense needs. Um, no, I'm just, I'm just not impressed with PSA or with the AK Heavy. Like I said, I plan on keeping it because... Having something that can run steel ammunition more or less flawlessly is cool and useful to have for a plinking gun, but this is not something that I'm ever really going to look at for any serious use. It's a plinking gun. It looks cool. It's, you know, fun to bump fire with ammunition that it likes, those kinds of things. But anything beyond that, this isn't the gun for that. Um, you know, I do like the fact that without the compensator on the end, you can fold the gun down uh, small enough that it will fit inside of an 18-inch pistol case. You have to put it in diagonally, but it uh, will actually fit in there. I, I did test that, and it works out pretty good that way. So, you know, the gun travels fairly well that way and all those kinds of things. And it is kind of a heavy gun. It's about 7 pounds as currently configured. So that's a little heavy to me, and it's definitely front heavy. But for a recreational gun... Mm, probably not that big of an issue and all that. It's just my biggest issue is just all those malfunctions. When you have an overall malfunction rate that exceeds 1% in a center fire gun, that is definitely a reason to pause and be concerned. Now, that does seem to be mitigatable by avoiding certain kinds of ammunition, at least with this particular gun, avoiding Remington Green and White Box, avoiding Winchester White Box, those kinds of things, and going for steel case, generic wolf, of all things, you know, it can be avoided. And also, like I mentioned, uh, with all kinds of ammunition, just trading out for the CZ 20-round magazines, the little black-windowed magazines that I have here, that also seem to work just fine. So there are workarounds to get it to being suitably reliable. Uh, I just don't like that it's, it's finicky. And like I said, I, every company has their lemons out there. That's true. But PSA seems to have a lot of them, and that seems to be their model, is that, you know, we let quality control slip, and we just kind of fix problems on the other end. And that's how we, you know, keep prices low. Well, if you're really interested in price, like I said, there are cheaper options out there, significantly cheaper options out there, that are far less finicky. The kel Sub 2009 millimeter is a good example of that. I wouldn't suggest the kel Sub 2040. That's fraught with problems. 
that the Celtic sub 2009 millimeter is actually pretty reliable and it's not very finicky at all. Like I said, as long as you stay away from the flat point ammunition, um, it's okay. I've never had a problem with it otherwise. Uh, not mine personally, but uh, the person that I gave it to uh, not had any issues with it. And then if you are willing to pay not a whole lot more, you know, this is an extra couple hundred bucks, being honest, you know, the, the CZ Scorpion. Uh, far more reliable gun, and especially if you're using the standard CZ magazines, very reliable. And I've also found it's phenomenally re reliable with these PSA AKV magazines and even the extended ones. No malfunctions or hiccups whatsoever, which is better than I can say for the Magpul magazines that were specifically designed for the Evo. Uh, so I will give PSA that. They make a pretty awesome magazine at a pretty awesome price. I will definitely give Palmetto State Armory kudos on that one. Good price, good magazine, works really great in my Scorpion. Doesn't work so great in my AKV that it was actually designed for, but I definitely plan on getting more of these AKV ma uh, magazines in the future just because they're cheap and they work so well in my Scorpions. But uh, back to the uh, point that I was trying to make, you know, if you want to go for a cheaper gun that's more reliable, there are ones that are out there, like the Caltech Sub 2000. If you want to get something that's going to be more reliable out of the box, provided you use relatively standard magazines for it. The CZ Scorpion does just fine at that too. It's more expensive, but it does just fine at that too. Um, this is a gun that is fairly expensive, but not very reliable. You know, when you, a kel Sub-2000 can beat your gun in terms of reliability and ammo pickiness and things like that, and just being able to run with the magazines that get shipped with the gun, that's not a good sign. When Caltech is beating you, that's usually not a good sign, to be honest. Okay, and I have kind of a love-hate relationship with Caltech. Like I said, this Caltech Sub 2000 seems to be pretty solid. Some of their other products that I've gotten, not great at all. Uh, you know, when they're beating you, that's that's not a good sign. Like they're they're not over, overly known for having super great quality control themselves. So yeah. There's cheaper guns that are more reliable than this, and if you want something that there's a greater probability that you're going to get a good gun out of the box and not have to send it in or deal with those kinds of things, you know, upgrading to a CZ Scorpion or something along those lines, not a bad way to go. Uh, like I said, if you really are budget-minded, there are good guns that you can get on a budget that will be every bit as reliable. If you're not truly budget-minded and you want something you know, that's also going to work out of the box pretty well. Well, there's options that way too. I can't think of a particularly good reason why you would want to go out and buy this unless you're just a fanboy, to be honest. If you just happen to like PSA and you like 9mm uh, AKs, well, not truly an AK, but AKS guns that are in 9mm, okay. You know, if it, it looks cool and you like it and all those kinds of things, fine, good, wonderful, whatever, you know. Do your thing, it's your money. But if you're looking at a gun that you want to be reliable out of the box, based on my experience with this gun, you can't look at that for the AKV. The AKV, in my experience, is not overly reliable out of the box. It is ammo sensitive, and also seems to be magazine sen sensitive. Like I said, the CZ Scorpion magazines, the little 20 rounders, does just fine with those but not with the actual PSA AKV magazines, which is bizarre and weird, but that's the way it is. You know, it runs the steel case ammo just fine. Brass case ammo, not so good, which is weird. Uh, not the typical experience that I've had with those kinds of ammunition, but that's how this gun runs. It's just idiosyncratic and weird and all those kinds of things. And if you're getting a gun to run right out of the box the first time, your odds to me do not seem to be as high with this gun as with other guns. Like I said, Keltec Sub 2000 out of the box is usually a very good gun by comparison. The CZ Scorpion, it is more expensive, a couple hundred bucks more expensive, but again, out of the box tends to be much more reliable, especially if you stick with factory magazines, or in my experience, even the PSA magazines work just fine in the Scorpion. All right, so that is the long rambling review of the AKV in 9mm by Palmetto State Armory. Overall summary is it's a gun and there are ways to shoot it that is reliable. 
but this particular example that we have here is indeed finicky and it causes me to question uh, PSA's quality control as a whole and the value that you're getting for the price point. Like I said, when there are cheaper guns that are more reliable and there are other guns that are not too terribly much more expensive that are also significantly more reliable, mm, not such a great thing. All right, that is my piece. Thank you all very much for listening. For those of you who stayed with me and try to have a good one out there and find some fun guns to shoot. Be safe, my friends. Don't do anything stupid.